let me just say, I love you back, NAACP. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Russell, for those kind words, and I want to thank you all. I mean, really, really thank you all for such a, a warm rep welcome. It is a, it's a privilege, and it is a real sincere pleasure to be with you, to be part of another important NAACP gathering, and to share the stage with so many good friends, dedicated partners, and indispensable, indispensable leaders. I want to thank President Jealous, Chairman Brock, General Counsel Kim Keenan, and the NAACP's National Board of Directors for inviting me to join you here today. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. It's nice to be outside of Washington, D.C. <laughs> this feels uh, like somebody just said, this feels like home. Now, as you may, you may know, I was born and raised in New York City, but Houston, New York's in the house. But uh, Houston's feeling a little bit like home today. And uh, it is also an honor for me to bring greetings from uh, another brother you know, President Barack Obama. And also to bring greetings from my fellow members of the cabinet, and from my colleagues across the United States Department of Justice. I'm also grateful for this chance to salute the essential work that, that you are doing here in the great state of Texas and all across our country to bring our nation together and to bring attention to the problems that we must solve, the wrongs that we must right, the divisions that we must heal, and the future that we must build. For for more than a century, the NAACP's leaders, members, and supporters have been defined and distinguished by your unyielding determination to do what you believe is right. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate and how much I am inspired by the example of strength that is this organization continues to provide for our nation and for, and for me personally. This convention is focused on issues of real consequence issues that directly affect people's lives and influence our nation's course. Now, I want to discuss some of the ways we must continue to build upon the social, political, economic, educational, and legal progress that this organization and generations, generations of like-minded civil rights pioneers, activists, advocates, and champions have struggled and have sacrificed to bring about. Today's gathering presents an important opportunity to celebrate and to give thanks for the visionary leaders from W.E.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells to Charles Hamilton Houston, Walter White, Roy Wilkins, Dr. Martin Luther King, our dear friends, our dear friends, John Payton and Clarence Mitchell, Jr., whose memory many of you gathered to honor yesterday and whose critical work as the NAACP's chief advocate in Washington is being carried on today with a renewed spirit and dedication by my good friend, Hillary Shelton. Now, this is a, a critical moment for each of us, not only to lift up their legacies, but to take up the work that became the cause of their lives. And it's a chance to recommit ourselves in this hour of need to the effort that now constitutes our, our sacred charge, our solemn obligation, and our breathtaking opportunity. Every one of us has the ability, and I believe the responsibility, to continue the work that has driven the NAACP's record of achievement. In short, it is time, yet again, to put our energy and skills to good use in advocating for the most vulnerable members of our society, in protecting the liberty and the sacred rights of every single person in this country, in safeguarding the basic infrastructure of our democracy, in ensuring economic and educational opportunities for all of our countrymen and women, 
and in carrying forward the fundamental and inclusive ideals upon which this country was founded and which continue to drive our pursuit of a more perfect union. Now, these were the values that a, a group of patriots first seized upon 236 years ago last week when they gathered in Philadelphia to draft a declaration that shook the foundations of an empire and set in motion the great American experiment that we are entrusted with today. They are the principles that another generation fought and died to extend less than 100 years later with the abolition of slavery in the aftermath of a terrible civil war that remade our nation. And also the ratification exactly 144 years ago this week, yesterday in fact, of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which finally endured, which finally ensured due process, equal protection, and for the first time, the full rights of citizenship for the African American people who helped to build this nation and for their heirs. Now, even, even within our own lifetimes, these are the essential ideals that have driven great leaders and ordinary citizens alike to stand up, to march forward, to reach out a hand, or simply to take a seat at a lunch counter or the front of a bus, in a classroom, or a courthouse in order to bring about transformative, once unimaginable progress. Now, one of these people was a brave young woman who in her desire to attend her, her state's public university had to march past a defiant governor, George Wallace, to integrate the University of Alabama. Now, I'm proud to say that this courageous young woman, Vivian Malone, would later become my sister-in-law. In In her pursuit of the educational opportunity that she deserved, Vivian was represented by the legendary civil rights attorney and former NAACP counsel, Fred Gray. With, with his assistance and with support from the NAACP and with the backing of the Justice Department I now have the privilege to lead, Vivian was able to open new doors of opportunity. And although she's no longer with us, her legacy continues to teach and to inspire us. Now, if Vivian were here with us this afternoon, I'm certain that she would be proud to help celebrate how far our nation has traveled on the road to equality in the decades since she took her rightful place in that university classroom. But, but, she'd also be the first to remind us that we still have much more to do. And that despite the advances that we've seen, and the fact that a direct beneficiary of the civil rights movement now sits in the Oval Office. Uh -oh, yeah. and, and that another has the honor of addressing you today as the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America. Despite that, despite that, our nation's long struggle for freedom and fairness is far, far from over. In fact, much of the hardest work remains unfinished. And for all the successes that we've enjoyed and the milestones that we've celebrated today in 2012, we cannot and we must not ignore the fact that there are still neighborhoods in America's most vibrant cities where too many kids go to prison, too few go to college where our young people are involved in and become victims of violence and where the doors to education and opportunity still seem closed. And there is too little outrage and not nearly enough action in response to the fact that nationwide homicide is leading cause of death for black men between the ages of 15 and 24. And and that more than 60% of young people of all races are exposed to violence at some point in their lives, either as victims or as witnesses, which can have devastating long-term consequences that last well into adulthood. NAACP, this is unacceptable. And it's why the leadership of organizations like the NAACP and the engagement of activists throughout Texas and across the country remains as vital as ever. It's also why, under the 
Obama administration, this Justice Department has made an unprecedented commitment to protecting the safety and the potential of our children. Through our landmark, <laughs> through our landmark Defending Childhood Initiative and our National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention, we're developing strategies for reducing violence and countering its negative impact. And I'm especially proud that for the first time in history, the department is now directing significant resources for the express purpose of addressing childhood exposure to violence, raising awareness of its ramification, and advancing scientific inquiry on its causes and its characteristics. We're working closely with other federal agencies, educators, and state and local partners across the country to disrupt the school to prison pipeline that transforms too many of our schools from doorways to opportunity into gateways to the correctional system. This is unacceptable. And what we're doing, what we're doing at the Justice Department is only the beginning. At every level of this administration, we're working in new ways and with a range of partners to achieve fairness and to expand opportunity from successfully advocating for the reduction of the unjust 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine offenses, to launching a new emphasis on reentry programs to ensure the successful reintegration into society of those who have become involved in the criminal justice system. Through the Justice Department's new access to justice office, we're fighting to expand the availability of desperately needed legal services and to advance pro bono initiatives in both the public and private sectors that can help provide representation, legal representation, for those who cannot afford it. And by any measure, our determination to build on these efforts, particularly through the work of the department's revitalized Civil Rights Division, has quite simply never been stronger. Now, as Attorney General, I am often mindful of the fact that I have the great privilege, but also the solemn duty of overseeing the enforcement of many of the laws and reforms that the NAACP fought so hard to enact. And I take this obligation very seriously. It is at the forefront of all that I do as Attorney General. For the department that I lead and for our allies across the country, this work is a top priority. And our approach, I don't think, has ever been more effective. Over the past three years, the Civil Rights Division has filed more criminal civil rights cases than ever before. In <laughs> including record numbers of police misconduct, hate crimes, and human trafficking cases. We have moved aggressively to combat continuing racial segregation in our schools and to eliminate discriminatory practices in our housing and lending markets where we recently achieved the largest residential fair lending settlement in American history. We have we've also worked to eliminate bias, combat intimidation, and ensure nothing but the highest standards of integrity and professionalism across our nation's law enforcement community. And alongside state, local, tribal, and international authorities, we've reinvigorated sweeping efforts to ensure that in our workplaces, in our military bases, in our classrooms, in our places of worship, in our immigrant communities, and in our voting booths, that the rights of all Americans are protected. Nowhere, nowhere is this clearer than on our work to combat hate crimes and to bring those who commit these vicious acts to justice. Over the past three years, the Justice Department prosecuted 35 percent more hate crimes than during the pre preceding three-year period. We have moved vigorously to enforce the landmark Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which the NAACP strongly supported and which President Obama signed into law in 2009. And we're also working to bring together a range of allies and partners to help strengthen our collaborative efforts to make good on the promise of equal justice and the protections of our legal system in every sector of society. Now, at a fundamental level, this is the same commitment that has driven us to expand access to and prevent discrimination in America's elections systems. And in jurisdictions across the country, it has compelled the Civil Rights Division's voting section to take meaningful steps to ensure integrity, independence, and transparency in our enforcement of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 
a law that the NAACP was instrumental in advancing. Now, especially in recent months, Texas, Texas has in, been, has in many ways been at the center of our national debate about voting rights issues. And I know many of you have been on the front lines of this fight. Here, as in a number of jurisdictions across the country, the Justice Department has initiated careful, thorough, and independent review of proposed voting changes, including redistricting plans, early voting procedures, photo identification requirements, and changes affecting third-party registration organizations in order to guard against disenfranchisement and to help ensure that none of these proposals would have a discriminatory purpose or effect. And as many of you know, yesterday was the first day of a trial in a case that the state of Texas filed against the Justice Department under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act seeking approval of its proposed voter ID law. Now, after close review, the department found that this law would be harmful to minority voters, and we rejected its implementation. Now, now, now listen to this. <laughs> listen to this. Under the proposed law, concealed handgun licenses would be acceptable forms of photo ID, but student IDs would not. Many of those without IDs would have to travel great distances to get them. And some would struggle to pay for the documents they might need to obtain them. We call those poll taxes. Yes. Since, since the passage of this law, the NAACP and other leading civil rights organizations have been spearheading critical efforts to protect the rights of minority voters in this and other states. And a growing number of you are working to raise awareness about the potential impact of this and other similar laws. And the fact that according to some recent studies, nationally, only 8% of white voting age citizens, while 25% of African American voting age citizens, lack a government issued photo ID. In our efforts to protect voting rights and to prevent voting fraud, we will be vigilant and we will be strong. But let me be clear. Let me be very clear. We will not allow political pretext to disenfranchise American citizens of their most precious right. Now, now I can't predict the future. future. And I don't know what will happen as this case moves forward. But I can assure you that this Justice Department's efforts to uphold and enforce voting rights will remain aggressive. And, and I have every expectation that we'll continue to be effective. The arc of American history has always moved towards expanding the electorate. It has what made this nation exceptional we will simply not allow this era to be the beginning of the reversal of that historic progress. I will not allow that to happen. For, for this and other reasons, I'm confident about where this work will lead us and the progress that passionate advocates like all of you will continue to make possible. And as we carry these efforts into the future, there's no question that we'll keep relying on organizations like the NAACP to help extend essential protections and to encourage broad-based engagement on a host of other issues of national concern. Now, I'm sure that like millions of others across the country, you were closely following last month's decisions by the Supreme Court yeah. to strike down major provisions of an Arizona law that would have effectively criminalized unlawful status and to uphold essential components of the Affordable Care Act. As President Jealous and Chairman Brock noted, these monumental rulings constituted an important step forward, providing a clear and final decision on a landmark health care law that will offer desperately needed help to millions of Americans and in the Arizona decision.
confirming the federal government's exclusive authority to regulate on immigration issues so that our nation speaks with one voice in this important area. I'm pleased that in both cases the court broadly affirmed the government's position as argued by the Justice Department. However, however, I remain concerned about the practical impact of the remaining provision of the Arizona law that requires local law enforcement officials to check the immigration status of anyone they even suspect to be here illegally. No American should ever live, or live under a cloud of suspicion just because of what they look like. <laughs> Going forward, we must ensure that Arizona law enforcement officials do not enforce this law in a manner that undermines the civil rights of Americans. In this work, I can assure you that the Justice Department will continue to be vigilant. At the same time, I recognize that the Justice Department will never be able to do it all, and that it simply won't be possible for government to make all of the progress that we need and that the American people deserve. So this afternoon, as we come together to celebrate the power of individual voices and the strength of collective action, we must also take stock of what's, what's left to do and reflect on the responsibilities that each one of us share to ourselves, to those whose memories we honor this week, and of course, to our children. Although the direction we must take is clear, the road ahead is far from certain. Significant obstacles and unprecedented threats remain to be confronted. And overcoming these challenges is sure to be anything but easy. But I firmly believe that if the leaders in this room heed the lessons of our past and follow the examples of our predecessors, if we keep faith in one another and in our democratic institutions, and if we rededicate ourselves to the essential work of helping freedom grow and extending the blessings of our Constitution to all men and women, there is no limit to the progress that we can make or the distance that we must and will travel together in the days ahead. So once again, thank you for your commitment to and your leadership of this work. May God, I love you back. <laughs> May God continue to bless our journey. May God continue to bless the NAACP. And may God continue to bless the United States Yay. of America. Thank you. If the delegates will pick up emergency resolution number two, NAACP strongly supports Attorney General Eric Holder. Therefore, be it resolved that the NAACP expresses its strong support for Attorney General Holder and his work at the U.S. Department of Justice to protect and enhance the civil and voting rights of all Americans, and be it further resolved that the NAACP calls upon all of its members to contact their members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate to express their outrage at the treatment of the first African American and one of the best attorney generals in American history, and be it finally resolved that the NAACP Washington Bureau is directed to send out updates to all units as necessary to inform and educate our national membership of this travesty of justice. I hear a motion and I see support. Is there discussion? All those in favor of the motion will raise your voting cards. Is there opposition seeing none? The motion is adopted. Yeah.